Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call the Operations Committee to order for October 19th, 2021. Are there any disclosures of pecuniary interest this evening? Seeing none, I'd entertain a motion for the approval of the agenda as circulated. I have Councillor Reavy, seconded by Councillor Abdallah. Those in favor? And that's carried. Thank you. Next up is the approval of the minutes of the Operations Committee for September 21st, having been circulated previously. I have a motion by Councillor Plummer, second by Councillor Abdallah. Those in favor? That's carried. We have the pleasure this evening uh, to welcome Mr. Pat Finnegan, uh, first up uh, regarding the Community Safety and Wellbeing Plan. So uh, welcome, Mr. Finnegan, and I'll let you take the floor. Yes. Yes, we okay. can yes. see it. Excellent. My name is Pat Finnegan. I'm a retired police officer. I was with the OPP for 30 years. Uh, my last 10 as the detachment commander in Lennox and Addington County, working very closely with communities, trying to solve community problems. I'm in my fourth year now at Loyalist College, teaching in the policing program. So I've kind of carried on with that particular theme. So just before we get started, I've got a couple of photos here, three to be exact, and I'm going to suggest that anyone in the room can look at these photos and predict what could happen next. So uh, the young lad on the left with a knife, he's about to stick in an electrical outlet. Uh, he could uh, be electrocuted. There's a young toddler playing on the edge of a swimming pool. Um, I'm going to suggest unattended. Uh, she could fall in, she could drown. And we have a curious young fellow playing with matches, which if they got out of control, you might set something on fire and place people's lives in danger. Now, as caring adults or community members, uh, anyone with a little bit of upstream thinking can uh, predict what might happen and then could intervene. You could, uh, with the young boy, they make covers for these outlets that protect them from children tampering with them. The, the utensils could be placed in a drawer that's locked. Uh, certainly, the toddler could be supervised and matches could be put away and this young lad could be educated about fire safety, et cetera. So the whole idea here is that if it's predictable, it's preventable. And that's that's an old, maybe tired saying, but it but it still rings true. And that's what community safety and well-being planning is all about. Figuring out who's at risk and why, and then getting upstream on that and trying to prevent it. So just a really quick recap, because quite a bit of time has passed by. I'm going to take you back to 2019 when uh, Deputy Mayor Gervais, also chair of the Police Services Board, collaborated with local police. There's Stefan Neufeld and Dean Ducro. Dean's now the, the chief of police in Deep River, as you know. Uh, they applied for and successfully obtained a community policing, or sorry, a community safety and policing grant. And with that grant, they were able to hire a uh, community safety and well-being planner. That's me. Now, um, Mr. Gervais did something very uh, proactive and generous, in my opinion. He sent letters out to neighboring communities, inviting them to participate in a joint plan, which is permitted under the legislation. And there was a little hesitation at first, but eventually, um, you know, everybody uh, agreed to form this joint plan. And so those are the nine municipalities that were now working together to develop a joint plan. So with that grant money, which came 10 months late, which isn't uncommon when you're dealing with grant money from the government. Uh, I was hired in January of 2020. And then in February, we had our first meeting. And it was to be in Pembroke at the uh, very lovely fire hall. And so I came up the night before because I read the forecast and there'd been some bad weather. So I thought I can't be talking about uh, predicting risk and, and being upstream and then try to show up on the day of a storm and be late. So I stayed next door at the holiday and woke up to a horrendous uh, snowfall. And uh, about eight or nine, uh, I think, of uh, our attendees out of the 30 or so that were planning to attend showed up. Uh, we had a little vote and we decided to go ahead with the session anyway. Uh, so I remember there's a little foreshadowing here. So careful what you wish for. On my drive home, I was thinking, all right, how am I going to get everybody else up to date? I wish I knew enough about technology to um, be able to develop something online and, and share it with those folks so they could at their own pace on their own time 
get caught up. As I said, careful what you wish for, because here's March, uh, COVID-19 hits and essentially the whole world hit the pause button and so did we as a planning committee. Uh, as I said, I teach at Loyalist College, so we took a couple of weeks off there, tried to figure out what to do next. And you know, um, I, I guess this is kind of how I felt and uh, as did most folks, we didn't know where to turn next. This technology existed, uh, but nobody knew how to use it. I think about the smart boards that are in most offices. I always, it's a little fun thing I do. I ask, does anybody know how to work that? And usually there's no one in the room knows how to work the smart boards. So I call them the not so smart boards. So we're all too busy driving to, to stop for gas, to retool and figure out, you know, what we could use to try and, and can carry on business in an online environment. Uh, well, I had to do some of that with the, the college in any event. And so we got through the rest of the semester into the spring and I started to learn and play with all different types of uh, uh, software and tech and uh, got pretty good at it actually. And spent my summer uh, developing um, this right here, which is uh, outlined in red at the top. Uh, there's four PowerPoint presentations there, but they're not just PowerPoint. They have uh, voice overlays in each slide so they're narrated by me uh, with each mouse click and each transition and you know it took me hours to to produce I, I got quite good at it in the end and i developed a couple of learning modules and i released that over the course of the summer and allowed the you know the rest of the committee to sort of get caught up well then by fall we were ready to to move on in a zoom world and here's a snapshot from one of our meetings uh, so the meetings went well. Uh, we never had full attendance, but of course the beauty of the Zoom meeting was that we recorded them and said, hey, if you can't make the meeting, you can listen to it later. The key is you have to listen to it later. But I know at least one uh, member did because she she reached out to me and she said, you know what, I did the dishes and cooked a whole meal listening to that meeting and I was so proud of myself at the end because it felt like a good use of my time. So we moved forward with, these are cover slides from four different modules. So the first one was orientation and then the data collection phase, the consultation phase, and the prior prioritization phase. So kind of in the in the fall and into December uh, of 2020, we completed the data collection and consultation phase. Uh, and then in January, I was the recipient of some bad news. I'd had a, a mole in my eyelid that uh, was uh, had been there for a couple of years. And I'd been having it looked at. I became concerned about it. And as a result of COVID was put on a 10 month waiting list. And by the time I got in at the end of the 10 months, uh, it tested as melanoma cancer. Uh, so that kind of um, took me out of the game for a little bit. Uh, I had some surgery where they cut away three quarters of my eye, reconstructed it. It was sewn shut for a month, um, cut open again, sewed up again. So there were five surgeries on your, on my eyelid, not a very, uh, a pretty vulnerable place to, to have work done. In any, any event, I thought things were good and I was on an immunotherapy treatment. You know, <clears throat> excuse me, on the 26th of May, 21, we uh, engaged online and uh, in the prioritization phase. And I was telling folks, you know, I think I'm in the clear. Thanks so much for your patience. Um, just a few days later on the 28th of May, um, oh, what I forgot to mention, the eye was healing fine, except a weird growth came back in a different spot on my eyelid. And we were hoping it was some sort of scar tissue and it tested as melanoma back and it was uh, and it was angry. And on the 28th of May, I had an oncologist look at me and say, if we don't get a handle on this, you're going to be dead in a year. Pretty unsettling news. Um, and then there was actually some surgery scheduled to remove my eye and, and a gland leaving my face kind of paralyzed and droopy. So I was going to have a hole in my head here where they were going to take a patch and put it in my eye socket and I was pretty sick over all of that. And uh, lo and behold, what I refer to as some miracle pills that were developed about seven years ago, they, they put me on these drugs and the drugs are killing the cancer. And um, I've been four months now. Um, apparently I just had some scans and they tell me they can't see any more cancer. It had moved in behind my eye. Now I had a heck of a time getting the, the um, side effects from the medication to settle down. So I was sick in bed a lot for the summer. So essentially I lost January and uh, through sort of July and a little bit into August, but I'm feeling great now. I'm back, I'm teaching full time. And uh, so just recently I was able to finish what I call a lived experience survey. And I got it out to our nine different municipalities. I think it was two days ago, Monday morning, I guess. And, um, and so this 
is a survey that focuses on risk factors and people's perceptions of those risk factors in the different municipalities that we live, work, and play in. And so uh, I just checked today because it's only been two days, and uh, top of the pack was uh, uh, the town of Petawawa with 26 responses already. So I thought I'd just give you a couple quick clips about what that looks like. It's a very simple survey done through Google Forms, which is a fantastic tool and it's free. As you can see, we've got a really good uh, broad representation here of, of uh, different age groups. With a, I know it's only 26 responses, but if that trend continues on, that's a, that's a pretty nice uh, variation. Uh, we've also got great variety of uh, professions, backgrounds, uh, uh, you know, work experiences, et cetera. Um, and I'll just show you. So here's a question. To what extent do you believe that homelessness is an issue? So this is interesting because five means it's a high priority. I think it's a big issue. 23% said it was a huge issue. and 30% said it wasn't an issue at all. So th those two groups are going to have to get together for an arm wrestle. But of course, it's early days. This is going to be, of course, lined up with and compared to other data from, from our emergency services, uh, downstream data sources, uh, police, fire, ambulance, public health, school boards, et cetera. So, so this is just the lived experience part. Just a couple more slides here. Do you believe drug addiction is an issue? So now you can see, uh, actually, I think I've got a, yeah, there you go. So uh, three, four, and five are the largest colors. So we've got a strong, strong opinion here that uh, drug addiction is an issue and perhaps needs to be addressed. Then when we get to uh, mental health, there's no surprise here. Um, look, those two chunks of the pie put it at a, at a four or a five. And I think anybody in the room could have put it predicted that, especially given the uh, COVID and what's going on. At the end of the survey, there's a chance to comment. I'm not going to read these verbatim, but I thought they were interesting. So already within two days, I think it's unfortunate that we have to have a food bank. We need to do something about the minimum wage. Uh, I'm an older woman who feels discriminated against. Um, this person's just happy to be here, kind of like myself right now. Uh, been here for over 30 years and lately I'm hearing about groups of teens bullying other teens and causing property damage. What's up with that? Hearing things about that on Facebook. Uh, just one last slide with comments, more traffic enforcement, teach people to show more respect. Good luck with that. Uh, again, COVID uh, and, you know, the results are going to be skewed because of COVID and I get that, right? But COVID's real and, and so, you know, two years ago if we were planning, COVID wouldn't have been on there as a risk factor. Well, we need to look at it today, get people back to work and stop the CERB. All right, so there's nine stages essentially to uh, community safety and well-being planning and, and the council resolutions were drawn up and, uh, and adapted. We moved through the orientation over the summer. We're still in data collection. You can be in these phases, uh, multiple phases at the same time. That's actually very natural, very normal. It's, it's, uh, it's um, the way it should be. So we're still working in these two phases. Uh, and very shortly, I hope that we'll be moving into the prioritization phase. Once we prioritize what it is that we wanna focus on, then we'll form implementation teams. So different folks from our advisory committee might decide to lead a team and look for content experts within the community, people with lived experience to come up with ideas about how we're gonna uh, create strategies to reduce the risk factors that have been identified for that particular problem. Then as a group, we get consensus because everything we do is through consensus. So we seek consensus. Um, are these the, the implementation strategies that we all agree on? Then I put everything together in a nice glossy final report. I can tell you right now, it's not going to be an 80 pager like some of the ones I've seen out there because nobody's going to read an 80 page report. It's going to be uh, very concise and very readable and uh, you know accessible to everyone. Uh, and then we look to implementation. Uh, okay. So, um, there was a July 1st deadline imposed by government. We kind of just picked a date and went with it. Uh, back in June, I knew we weren't going to meet that deadline. So uh, on the advice of the ministry's lead, who I'm in touch with on a regular basis, she said, Pat, put a letter together representing the municipalities that you're working with and send it off to the Solicitor General, which I did. Uh, so I sent that in June and uh, crickets. August 19th, I did get a response and essentially you know, it was the ministry's here to help. Is there anything we can do? It's really encouraging to hear that you're making progress and that you're collaborating. Uh, way to go, guys. Good job. Um, and then here you'll see in the sign-off, 
I appreciate your continued efforts. Uh, all the best in your recovery. So uh, what I want to say about that is there's teeth in the legislation that can be used against the municipality that's just refusing to comply. This is, hey, I'm not interested in your community safety well-being plan. We're not doing it. They would send in their own um, coordinator uh, to do the plan and then send you a bill. There's absolutely nothing that the, the ministry can do with a municipality that is in earnest trying to complete the plan, and that's us. So I don't know how long I've been, but this is the second last slide. Um, so yeah, I feel bad about this. I feel bad about missing the timeline. I, I feel horrible about it, and it's it's one of the things that's, that's stressing me out. But at the same time, I'm trying to reduce the stress in my life because it's not good for you, especially if you're you're trying to win the game against cancer. And, and I came across these two little clips on Instagram the other day, but the one on the left really kind of hit me. I'm not behind or unproductive because I can tell you I'm, I'm working as hard as I can. I'm doing as much as my mind and body are allowing me to do under perpetual stress and fatigue. So, so like I said, I'm about 95% back to my old self, but I do have to take these, uh, these, these drugs every day and every night at uh, exactly the right time. And, and I'm going to have to take them for a couple of years to, to make sure that I'm in the clear. So, you know, uh, I guess what I, what I want to say to you is um, I'm not going to, I'm not going to throw out another deadline. I had thrown out October because I had to throw something out there. It, this is a very organic process. I'd just be guessing. I want this to be real. I want it to be meaningful. Uh, and when we get it done, we get it done. And it's a plan then that the municipalities are going to work together on for forever, potentially. So if you think about a, a plan to, uh, to exercise and, and eat right, if you did that for a year, you wouldn't just stop. Because if you did, you'd go right back to where you started. So um, I'm really excited about this. Um, I think we're going to have a great plan. I'm, I, we have a great working group and lots of uh, energy and excitement around this. And right now I can tell you that unless something changes dramatically for me, um, we've got momentum and we're moving forward. So it's not so much time to say goodbye. I'll stop the share and, uh, and take questions. And I hope that I wasn't am I close to my 15 minutes. I'm always, I always go a little long. Problem at all, Pat. So, is there any uh, uh, questions from Council? So, I have Councillor Abdallah and Councillor Lafreniere. Uh, through the chair, thank you, Mr. Finnegan. And, and it's very glad to hear that you're, you're getting better. You've been through a lot. Um, so, the Community Safety Wellbeing Plan is a, is a great uh, thing for a community because it gets all the groups involved working on solving problems of discrimination and crime drug addiction, et cetera. Um, I just want to clarify or confirm. So during the consultation process, you meet with uh, local school boards, law enforcement, mental health services, social service agencies, and uh, local groups like we have the grind who help out the less fortunate with local meals and mental health support. And we, all, we also have a diversity committee that council adopted Will you be meeting with them also? Yeah, so so right now, because we can't do the the face to face very well, and uh, uh, I'm certainly what you would consider immunocompromised at the moment. So uh, you know we're doing the distance thing with the technology, and that's why I started with the lived experience survey. Um, soon, I'm going to release a PDF version of that, so folks that choose to can print it out and make it more accessible. So it could be that, Let's say, for example, you've got people waiting in the in the police station. They could be invited to fill out a survey on hard copy, and then if those were returned to me, then I could enter all that information. But yes, uh, it is my intention to engage those other groups. And I'd already heard about the grind and, and some of the work that they're doing there. So no, for sure. And and what I may have to do is just kind of deputize deputize people on my behalf to go out and, and do that and then report that to the wider group. 
Uh, thank you. And, and just to add to what uh, what Pat is saying, uh, early on, thanks to uh, Heidi at the back, uh, very early on, we gave Pat a very detailed list of uh, a lot of the stakeholders. Uh, and had it not been for COVID, uh, certainly I think it would, uh, it would be moving along uh, a lot better certainly the in-person meetings were, were fabulous but i got to tell you when we do even the zoom meetings uh with all the different individuals and we're all there because we are interested and we want to see this uh be successful uh um, this man is ex extremely dialed in and with him uh uh, directing the group we can move along uh, quite well uh, and everyone that's there uh, knows the contacts within their community it, Pat will tell you he's not from Renfrew County and so uh, he's heavily relying upon okay who do you got in your community so uh, Heidi was very good to create a very thorough list and say uh, this is who you need to contact if you want to know what's going on in Pembroke and then similarly the other municipalities stepped to the plate and said uh, this is who you need in our municipality and to ensure that he had a, a well rounded idea uh, and certainly uh, uh, certainly educating uh, the, the whole group in terms of uh, the the foundation of policing and things that I never knew uh, knew before so the very very interesting meetings I'll, I'll give it that uh, Councillor Frenier thank you hi Pat great name by hi. the way great name by the way yeah. um, thank you I just want to say thank you for your work I'm happy to hear that uh, you're doing better and I thought I sensed that you were trying to maybe tell us why you're a little late, but no explanation is needed. Please don't feel like, oh, you know, he's taking way too long uh, because this is a well-being plan and I know that you have the support of council to take your time to make sure you look after yourself because this will take care of itself eventually. So really just put yourself first, okay? Yeah, well, thanks very much for that. Yeah. And, you know, that is on my mind. It, I've never missed a deadline. I stayed up all night to, to meet one, but I've never missed one. And that, and so this is bothering me, even though I think, you know, I've got the, the trifecta of excuses and that the, yeah. the money came 10 months late. We had a pandemic and then I got cancer. I still feel bad. And uh, so if you sense some of that, you're right. Don't um, feel bad. Okay. Thank you. For thank you. <laughs> Any other questions from councillors? If not, I want, I want to thank you again, Pat, for giving us this update and this presentation to... Uh, uh, to Deputy Mayor, Deputy Mayor, I had, had a question. Oh, Councillor Jackano? <laughs> thank you. Uh, you can hear me. Uh, thank you, uh, Pat, for your, uh, for your wonderful presentation. And I'm glad to hear that uh, the Deputy Mayor and his... Uh, tremendous wisdom and knowledge invited all the other communities around our area to come together. That shows uh, tremendous leadership as well. Uh, and I like to hear the fact that you said you're not going to produce an 80 page report. I'm glad to see that we still have people with common sense among us. Obviously you're one of them. And I just want to commend you as, uh, you know, having the, uh, that superior human, uh, how would I put it, uh, drive an ethic to carry on in the face of adver uh, adversity. Uh, the OPP obviously has uh, been fortunate to have a person of your caliber uh, within their organization for such a long time and to have you at a, a college uh, expressing your, uh, you know, your wisdom to young people coming up. I think uh, you're leaving your mark with all of us. So uh, just keep doing what you're doing. And when you're busy, you can't be thinking about being sick. So uh, continue with that. I'm very pleased to uh, have met you uh, through the Zoom process and uh, good luck. Thanks. No, you, you've got that exactly right. And thank you for those words. And, um, you know, I, I went through a period of the summer where I started, you know, I was more well than I'd ever been, but then I actually got kind of depressed. I went through a two week period where I could hardly I knew I needed to be doing things and I, I couldn't make myself do anything. And, and, and so I was able to get myself out of that. I'm a big self-help guru, uh, but it's given me some empathy now for people who are actually experiencing depression because I'd never experienced that in my, in my life. And, it, you know, I just could not move forward. I just couldn't make myself do it. But when school started, you know, I didn't have a choice. And of course uh, you're right. You can't think about two things at the same time. So, so that's been the, that's been absolutely healing for me and it's given me 
a chance to kind of build my energy back up and then and now I'm hitting my stride again with the with the safety planning and, and, and everything is good. And then just one other comment, you said, you know, maybe I'm wise to, to want to keep it simple, but it, it was Albert Einstein said, if you're setting goals and you don't write them in a way that a five-year-old can understand them, then you probably don't have very clear goals. So that, that's that's what I'm thinking. Thank you again, uh, Pat. Good night. All right. Thanks, guys. Have a great night. Appreciate your time. Bye-bye. Bye. The next up we have this evening is the 2020 draft financial statements. And we have with us tonight, uh, tonight it's our pleasure to have uh, um, Fred Sinclair as well as uh, our treasurer, Ms. Lochte. So, Ms. Lochte, do you want to uh, kick off? Thank you, Deputy Mayor. So Mr. Fred Sinclair from Dean Sinclair Chartered Professional Accountants is attending this evening to present the 2020 draft consolidated financial statements for the Corporation of the City of Pembroke. So following his presentation tonight, staff is recommending that committee accept the draft consolidated financial statements for the year ended December 31st, 2020 as final as presented. And I'll pass it on to Mr. Sinclair. Thank you. Thank you, Angela, and good evening, everyone. I was, can I share a screen? Certainly, if you can. <laughs> okay, thank you. Is it sharing? <clears throat> no, so far. <laughs> no, so far. Is it sharing now? Yeah. Yep. Yes. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so, um, as Angela said, I'm here to present the financial statement for the year ended December 31st, 2020. <clears throat> These are the consolidated financial statements. So, they don't uh, jive concisely what you've been seeing all year because they include all the entities that the city has control of. So, as consolidated financial statements, they include the city, the library board, the BIA. They're adjusted for public sector accounting board standards, so they include capital assets and depreciation. They also uh, include your consolidated share of the airport, as well as the waste management board. And we also include on a portion of consolidation, a modified consolidated basis, the two um, hydro utilities. But they are the financial statements that are required to present to the province of Ontario. They're intended to be a public document for ratepayers, uh, lending agencies, province uses these to analyze your financial condition and so on. So the first pay I'm looking right now at the index page and um, it just details all the financial statements in the package. <clears throat> I won't go into all of them. I'll go into some of them and make highlights. Um, first page, um, page four is our independent audit report. There are reports directed to members and rate payers inhabitants and rate payers of the city of Pembroke. We conducted, we audited the consolidated financial statements of the corporation of the city of Pembroke, which are comprised of the consolidated statement of financial positions as of December 31st, 2020, as well as the consolidated statement of operations, change in net financial assets and cash flows the year then ended, and the notes of the accounting and the notes of the financial statements. In our opinion, the financial statements present fairly your financial position as of December 31st, 2020, and the results of operations for the year then ended. We've conducted our audit in accordance with Canadian generally accepted auditing standards and conducted all the procedures we put necessary in the circumstances. And in our opinion, the financial statements are presented fairly and correctly. It's essentially what we call the clean audit opinion. So we're saying that the financial statements are materially correct. Uh, the next page we'll look at is the statement of financial position, a uh, consolidated statement of financial position. That's page three. I believe you've received a copy of them already by email as part of your uh, meeting package. <clears throat> it's page six of the financial statements. Looking at that, um, this is out of the whole package. This is probably the most important or useful financial statement out of all of all the statements. The province does a financial indicator analysis when they get your financial statements. And in addition to this, we prepare and file on your behalf a financial information return. So they use it and these financial statements to assess your financial position. This statement, the statement of financial position, 
is used as a basis for six out of seven of the financial indicators. So I'll point them out as I go along and, and present some of the information here. <clears throat> so looking at this statement then, your bottom line, the accumulated surplus at the end of the year is $147,135,341, up from roughly $138,000 last year. You've had a roughly 8.8 .8 million increase in your financial position this year, which is a, a very good improvement increase over the year. I'll turn right now to page 14, which gives a detail of how that accumulated surplus is held. There's a number of components. So this is the consolidated schedule of accumulated surplus. We see that the total at the bottom, 147 million ties into the state of financial position. So your surplus is comprised of uh, reserves, excuse me, <clears throat> reserve funds of 9.8 million compared to 9132 last year. Reserves of 10,858,526 dollars compared to 10,461,348 last year. So you can see your reserves and reserve funds have increased by roughly a little over a million dollars this year. So that's good. Um, in terms of comparing you to other municipalities your size, you're in a in a good position reserve wise, your reserves are slightly higher than most municipalities your size in this region. Looking at the reserves, there's two key new ones this year. Under reserve funds, you'll see uh, there's a COVID-19 safe restart reserve. The reserve fund was established this year for 567,759. And there was a contingency reserve established this year as well at 590,179. Contingency was set up for uh, legal fees or legal contingency of 200,000 and an operating reserve of 390,179. If those, the resolutions state that if those don't get used for those purposes, they are to go towards the aquatic center. <clears throat> Under surpluses, you can see that surpluses then hold to 126,467,249. They are comprised of invested in tangible capital assets of 114,879,589, up from 106,000 last year. Your general surplus, general revenue fund surplus here was 805,634, down from last year at roughly 1,493,000. But the 805 is still a really very strong reserve position to be in at the end of the year. Last year was extremely high, but the 805 is still a very good solid number. The BIA had a reserve, a surplus of 71,866 at the end of the year. Uh, your share of the landfill operations board deficit was 41,965. You had equity in the electric util utilities at 13,443,534. So you can see that that equity increased by roughly $400,000 this year, which is good. However, the utilities didn't pay dividends this year, and we'll see when we get to the statement of financial activities. And then we have unfunded liabilities. Uh, employment benefits, which have unfunded amounts of 2297000 and landfill closure costs of 393000 So all told, there were total surplus of 126467249 plus reserve funds of 20668092 which add up the total surplus of 147135341 which is a very significant increase. The increase is roughly, roughly $8.8 million over the previous year, so you had a very good financial year this year. I'm going back to the statement of financial position, page, um, page six. So that surplus is held as <clears throat> um, financial assets of $47,494,029. <clears throat> minus liabilities of 25,617,124, leaving us with net financial assets of 21,876,905, plus non financial assets of 125,258,46. Now, the net financial assets <clears throat> is an interesting number. What that essentially represents is if you closed your doors on December 31st, received all the money owing to you, all the receivables, paid all your bills, excluded values for capital assets, you would have 21,876,905 in the bank. So the province assesses you as being in a good position there. They assign that a low level of risk. So you're in a very strong financial position in terms of net financial assets. Um, 
Financial assets include cash of 20 million at 6.6. They assess you, the ministry assesses you being in a strong cash position. You had investments of 873.304, a little bit misleading. Those are actually your shares of investments of the waste management site in the airport that arise upon consolidation. Tax receivable of 1,889,690 compared to 1,667,104 last year. You're up roughly 200,000 over last year. It represents roughly 7.2% of your total billings. You're still considered in the low risk category. Last year, your total taxes in arrears were 6.5%. So there is a slight increase this year on a percentage basis, but you're still in a very good position in terms of your tax arrears, especially when you're compared to um, similar municipalities. Water and sewer receivables were close to last year, 395,000. Other accounts receivable were 3,244,731. That's up over last year. It's mostly a result of capital grants still outstanding at the end of the year. Um, inventories for resale is your fuels at the marina plus your share of airport fuels. And then, as I said earlier, your investment in municipal electric utilities with 13 million four forty three five thirty four. So overall, they add up to roughly 47. Non-financial assets <clears throat> include your um, investment in tangible capital assets. At depreciated values, roughly 124 million 737. That's up significantly this year. So that has contributed in large part to your increase in accumulated surplus because you had a lot of investments in capital assets this year, uh, far in excess of your depreciation at normal rates. Um, <clears throat> so looking at that overall, then or in terms of an assessment of your financial condition, the ministry considers you to be in a strong surplus position strong cash position, a strong position in terms of accounts or tax receivable, and a strong debt position as well. Under long-term debt, you can see at the end of the year, there was long-term liabilities of 17,050,899. Down from last year, roughly one, we paid down roughly 1.5 million in debt this year. So you're considered, you're, they assess your debt level at being at a moderate risk, but you're just on the cusp of being in a low risk assessment for debt. In fact, uh, by the end of this year, once you make your first payment on debt in 2022, without incurring more debt, you will be in what the ministry considers a low risk category for your debt position. Also in liabilities, there are accounts payable at the end of the year of 5,181,000 close to last year. Um, deferred revenues, you'll see there's a significant decline there, uh, 655,909, 250,000 last year use some of your gas tax funds for capital purposes this year, which is what the intent was. And then we have unfunded liabilities for employee benefits and landfill closure costs, as I said before. Uh, moving on to the statement of operations, the next page you can see um, <clears throat> you had an annual surplus of 8,868,927. Again, a very significant surplus this year. Uh, last year was Significant this year was even better. So you've had a really good year in terms of your overall uh, financial condition. Revenues this year amounted to 44,519,071. Expenditures were 35,650,144. It's a little hard to compare to budget. The better comparative figure is last year. So your revenues are up roughly 1.5 million over last year. Expenses are down roughly 300,000 over last year. You don't quite match up with the budget because when you prepare your budget, you prepare it for uh, municipal operating purposes. The budget doesn't include capital asset depreciation values, whereas the actual report, the actual reported numbers do include depreciation, changes in reserves, and so on. But overall, uh, that bottom line accumulated surplus ties into the balance on the state of financial position. The next statement, uh, statement in net, the change in net financial assets, just as details that change in your net residual cash position, if you will. Uh, so you ended up in a very strong net financial asset position of 21,876,905. The next schedule is a statement of cash flows, takes your operating expenditures and converts it to change in cash position. So you can see that um, you did have a decline in cash this year, most because you bought capital assets. You started the year with roughly 29589000 in cash, ended with 27608 but you're still in a very strong cash position. The next schedule, I'll go through it quickly because there are a lot of schedules. The next schedule, um, Schedule 2, just details, um, sorry, Schedule 1, 
details reserves. Uh, it includes reserve funds. You can see that you started with combined balances of 19,593, closed through to reserves and reserve funds of 20,668,092 at the end of the year. And as I said, you're in a very good position in terms of reserve funds compared to municipalities of your size. Schedule two is lumped into schedule one as well. <clears throat> schedule three uh, details changes in deferred revenues. You can see the big change this year is in uh, the federal gas tax where you used, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, yes, you transferred 2,335,772 capital. Uh, the next page is a very busy schedule, but it details your capital assets at historical cost and at depreciated values by asset class and by functional classification. So I won't go into that in detail other than to point out that your Net book value this year is 124 million seven thirty seven eight sixteen, which is all to report in the statement of financial position. Um, getting to the notes, then, <coughs> um, you're following accounting policies for public sector accounting board enterprises, which is a, you are as a Canadian municipality. So these financial statements are comparative to municipalities across the country. So you can you can your results and in statement of Financial position can be compared to other municipalities right across the country because you follow the same accounting standards. I won't look at all the notes, but I will highlight some of them that are of interest. Uh, I didn't go, I won't go into note two or note one, excuse me, because the note, those notes have not changed from the previous year and they are standard notes. And note two details cash. So out of your cash, Roughly 10 million 465 of that is reserve fund cash and obligatory reserve cash. So uh, that's required to be set aside for those purposes. The investments are your share of investments held by uh, the airport and by the waste management board. Note four is a fairly long lengthy note with just details and required disclosure details your investment in the electric, electric utilities. I won't put that in great detail, but you can see those numbers tie into the statement of finance position but it provides extra information for the users if you want to see how those utilities did this year, and what your share of their assets and equity is. Now, note five is always of interest in your long-term debt at the end of the year. <clears throat> so you can see your total debt at the end of the year was $17,050,899. <clears throat> That's comprised of I have it detailed here in my notes as to what those loans are for. Going to the top, the first loan for 328,000 is a loan for the Recreate Waste Recovery Board of the adventure taken out in 2002. That would be paid off in early 2022. So that's a significant loan you're retiring. The next loan for 4.6 million is taken out for loose control, loose control plant in Miramichi Lodge. Uh, the balance at the end of the year is for six, four million six eighty one two twelve. That will be paid off in two thousand twenty six. Uh, the next loan for three million thirty six thousand is taken out for uh, road pro road and bridge projects in two thousand and twelve. The balance now is three million thirty six thousand nine forty nine. Won't be paid off until two thousand forty two. Uh, the loan for three point nine million three million nine fifty two five seventeen is for the OBP station. That will be paid off until two thousand forty five. The, um, the loan for 184,2620 was taken out for streetlight upgrades with uh, our river energy solutions. That will be paid off at the end of uh, at the end of next year. That's one more year to go on that. Actually, in a couple of months, that will be paid off. Uh, the next loan, 15,000, will be paid off early next year. That's your share of the lease at the waste management board. Uh, then the next loan, next large loan, 4.7 million was for the fire hall and for the pumping station. That won't be paid off in 2048. Then your share of debentures issued by uh, the airport is $60,024. They come due in 2040. That's a new debenture issued this year. <clears throat> so you're in a very strong debt position right now as well. As I said, uh, early in the new year, you'd be in a low risk category. Now I know you've got new uh, debt plan for the future, there's some major projects coming up. I believe um, the treasurer has given me the details of, of what those projects are 
And uh, there's three major projects. I believe the total cost in those was roughly $18 million. You could fund those with new debt and still be in a low risk, excuse me, still be in the medium risk category. So it really, you could fund those and, and still be in the same risk assessment category you're in now. <clears throat> Your overall, <clears throat> it's kind of strange because the province assigns a debt capacity calculation for you. So using their uh, annual repayment limits and running the calculation on that using a normal interest rate, well, I'm, I'm in a little high, even at, at 5%, you would be allowed to borrow as much as 60, $65,000. I'm not ever suggesting you do that, but it gives you an idea of how much debt the municipality could borrow. However, having said that, if you borrowed much more than 20 million, you'd be put into a uh, province would assess you as being in a high risk category for debt. Uh, this page uh, just details how much debt you are paying off this year, each year. So in 2021, you'd be paying your debt down by 1.6 million, which is roughly what you paid down last year as well. So the debt's being paid down very well. Uh, note six details uh, employee benefits and post employment liabilities. So these are future liabilities that the city faces. You don't have to fund these now, uh, but they are a potential, well, they are in fact a real liability, but sometime down the road, as your employees retire, there's not a, a debt or liability you have to fund or tax for now. It's something we need to be aware of going, going forward in the future because they will become a liability at some time in the future. It could be 20 years before, before it's a real major concern. But we're paying we're paying little amounts each year as employees retire. Uh, they had a, we had a new actuary. Well. You were required to have a new actual calculation done this year. So note six provides additional information on the results of the actuarial calculation. I won't into that in detail. Other than to say that they've they've calculated an accrued liability at the end of the year of one roughly 1.3 million, which we factored into our numbers. Uh, note eight discloses your landfill closure costs for part of the waste management site. So um, your share of the liability to date is roughly 382,000. You can see under the city share. Uh, note nine details expenditures by object. The financial statements present expenditures by function, but we are required to disclose uh, expenditures by object as well. So this details how much you spend on wages and benefits, how much on long term debt, and so on. Now, the rest of the notes are fairly standard notes. I won't go into those in any detail. Um, I know I've gone through it fairly quickly, but I'd be happy to answer any questions anyone may have. Uh, I would summarize by saying I think you're in a quite good financial position at the end of the year, and you've had a very successful financial year. Again, if there's questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you, uh, Mr. Sinclair. Uh, excellent report, as, as always, as we've come to uh, expect from you. Uh, is there any questions for Mr. Sinclair? Uh, seeing no questions for Mr. Sinclair, I just wanted to thank you for uh, uh, this evening providing a, a, another excellent report to, to us. Um, and uh, uh, I guess credit to, uh, to uh, Ms. Lochte in terms of the uh, manner in which the city runs, uh, runs its ship, so to speak, and certainly an aggressive repayment schedule on the long-term disability, but certainly I'm always pleased when I hear the different comments in terms of, uh, you know, good position in terms of reserves or financials and so forth, and that we're a low risk when it comes to tax arrears. So uh, thank you very much uh, for providing the report this evening. And I'm trying to switch uh, files here. So as I understand it, uh, Mr. Sinclair and Ms. Lochte, you're looking for a motion uh, to accept the draft consolidated financial statements for the year ending December 31st, 2020? That's correct. So is there a motion for that? Councillor Reavy, seconded by Councillor Abdallah. Those in favor? And that's carried unanimously. Thank you again, Mr. Sinclair. Okay, thank, thank you and good evening, everyone. So I'll be in touch with you, Angela, to get the appropriate letter signed for it so we can release the final copies. I'll be in touch tomorrow, thanks. And I want to thank Angela for her assistance with the audit as well. She's done a very good job for you there and uh, very helpful to us as well. So thanks, everyone, and good evening. Okay. The next up then is 
Six A fee waiver requests, Ms. Lochte. Thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor. Uh, so the organizers of uh, Vendors of the Valley are holding their first fall hall market um, on October 22nd, 2021 at Two International Drive in Pembroke. So this is a vendor market featuring local vendors to purchase products from as well as uh, food and beverages from local businesses. Um, this year, the proceeds from the market via ticket sales and sponsorships uh, after costs are deducted will be going towards the Pembroke Regional Hospital Foundation. Uh, the organizers of this event have asked that the uh, business license fees be waived for this event. Uh, as per bylaw 2020-16, a business uh, license application and fee is required for a market of this type as a transient vendor. Um, so uh, committee direction is required um, uh, to waive the fees for this business license and the revenue loss associated uh, with this fee is $252.25. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lochte. So motions and discussion. Councillor Abdalla. So I, <clears throat> I spoke with the uh, two people making the request on the phone a few weeks ago. And these are two nurses that are in frontline health care at the Pembroke Regional Hospital. And they have this business that they set up. And this particular event is this Friday. And they're raising money for the Pembroke Regional Hospital Cancer Care Program. And I know we get requests for waiving fees and that for renting the Pembroke Memorial Center, different events, but I look at these cases as a, on a case by case situation. And the um, hospital, the, you know, people can go and get cancer care locally. It's so, it's so important. And so, and these two women are organizing this event out at uh, O'Kenny's property on the edge of town and uh, it's a destination event but it's also a fundraiser so I think we can waive the fund waive the fee for this event I think it's worthwhile the cause is worthwhile so I'll make a motion to waive the uh, transient business fee for this event okay so I have motion from Councillor Abdallah Councillor Frenier I'd like to second that motion Okay, and then Councillor Reavy, I saw your hand up. I was going to second it as well, but um, I think that uh, what Councillor Abdallah said, that it's a first-time event and it is something that means so much to the uh, members of our community. To, if we can have cancer care in the city, driving back and forth to Ottawa when you're sick is just not um, a good option. So I'd be happy to support them in their first venture. Does anyone else wish to speak before I speak? Seeing none. Um, so I'm going to oppose the motion for four different reasons. The first is that we just implemented this bylaw last year and uh, to deviate from it uh, this quickly, I do not believe to be prudent. The second one is when I read the letter that uh, was accompanying the particular report, it says that the uh, parties are requesting that this, there be this waiver of this uh, charge by the city of Pembroke. However, it doesn't appear that they're waiving any of their costs. It says that uh, money will be given to the charity after the market costs are deducted, which I presume is their, uh, their take on the particular uh, event. Um, thirdly, uh, to re uh, remain, sorry, to remove the revenue for the City of Pembroke is again to remove revenue that would be required to administer this particular bylaw. And last but not least, uh, which is the most important part of the reason, as I understand it, why this bylaw was passed last year, uh, was to level the playing field between the commercial taxpayers that already exist in the city of Pembroke and temporary vendors, which is what this is. So for all those reasons, I would be opposing the motion. I don't know if anyone else wishes to speak before I call the vote. Councillor Lafrenia and I have Councillor Abdallah. I understand uh, the intent of your comments uh, because we just created a bylaw. I guess the thing is there's a lot of fundraisers <clears throat> in the community that probably fall under the radar on something like this. Often, if a charity is having a fundraiser, people do bring their wares to maybe a cafeteria and, you know, have a silent auction or whatever you want to call it. And often, 
the expenses of the organization that are putting on the fundraiser are deducted and all the profit is donated. And sometimes they do come under the radar if they're held in a cafeteria of an organization or a sidewalk, let's say, of someone's home. So I think that because this came to the attention of the city, that's why they found out there was a permit and blah, 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 blah. So I'm not saying our permit is wrong. I'm just saying that there are a lot of charities that have events that do fly under the radar. And organizations come in, support the event, display their wares, take their profit, and donate the rest. That's all I'm saying. So I'll continue to support this because at least they were, they came to us and they were honest about what they're doing and the proceeds are going to a very worthy cause. It's not a large amount of money. It's not like we're waiving the PMC fees. So I will still support this motion. Okay, I have Councillor Abdel and then I have his worship. So just to clarify, when I spoke to them on the phone, they are doing this out of the goodness of their heart, this event, and they're working very hard at it, and they are not taking money themselves for this event. And uh, like Councillor Lafreniere and Reeve said, you know, this is the cancer unit at the hospital are raising funds, and this is a one-time event, like a first-time event, and I think we should support it. But they are not taking a cut of any profit, all the direct profit will go to the hospital. An expense like renting tables and that, that's a cost, but they are not personally benefiting from this. Thank you. Your Worship? I'm prepared to uh, support this request. Um, we realize that as far as the Pembroke Regional Hospital is concerned, there are a lot of items that aren't covered uh, by the province, and one of them, for instance, is the cancer care that they are they are trying to raise the funds for and it's a case of raising trying to raise over 200 I'm sorry uh, two million dollars and they had a very successful on gala campaign but they've also it's been a, it's been a rough year I, I think for all charities trying to raise funds but uh, with the district hospital being in the city of Pembroke and uh, uh, the fact that again the bulk of the money is going to the hospital, which helps all of us, especially in regards to cancer care. And I agree with Councillor Reevy, not having to drive to Ottawa to be able to receive the service here within the city, I think is so important. So I, I, I just see it as a, a donation to the foundation, which is of value. Thank you. Councillor Giacono. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, I'm in a bit of a quandary with that one as well. We seem to, you know, uh, dole out money to people that are putting on performances at seniors' homes without any regard for the financial impact. But then again, here's a small amount of money that's being requested to be waived uh, for a good cause. And I mean, we had an individual speaking be before us this evening, Pat Finnegan, you know, who suffered through uh, a debilitating disease, cancer, and still carries on the fight. And I think for that reason, I will be voting in favor of supporting this uh, this motion as well. It brings people together and we duly really do need that after the, uh, you know, the COVID depression, a lot of people have been in, people need to get out. They need to be distanced, of course, but they need to socialize. The fact that there's human interaction is very important. And for 243 bucks, I'll be voting in favor. Mr. Plummer. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, first of all, we understand that cancer is a very, you know, debilitating disease, and we want to support anything we can to do that. But I'm uh, will not be voting in favor of the motion, just on the basis of every time we. It's very easy to give away other people's money. If we wanted to give a donation, we feel strongly about a, about something. There's certainly nothing stopping any individual to donate from their own pocket. Um, at any time, someone can make a request. I do get phone calls. Do you want to support this charity? This charity. And you give what you can, um, but just I'm not in favor of giving away the public purse because it's not my money. Thanks. So I think uh, everyone has had their uh, say, so I'll call the question on the motion that's already on the floor. Those in favor and against, and the motion is carried. 
Uh, thank you, Ms. Lochte. The next item up is vehicle purchasing, Mr. Lewis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The operations department is seeking approval from the committee to proceed with the procurement of four pickup trucks in 2021 with the money to come out of fleet reserves in 2022. As per our procurement policy, committee must approve the procurement before we can proceed with tendering for the vehicles. The fleet replacement schedule includes four pickup trucks to be replaced in 2022. Information to date leads the department to believe that it will take roughly eight to 10 months for delivery of the vehicles due to so shortages in parts for manufacturing. Presently, we are one truck down as it had to be taken out of service due to deficiencies in the frame and the use of the former fire chief's vehicle as an alternate is not an option as that vehicle has also been taken off the road. The operations department is util utilizing the director's vehicle and the old bylock car for employees doing locates and for staff transportation. The four pickup trucks being replaced range from a 2006 model up to a 2012 model and are all beyond their estimated useful life. All vehicles suitable for sale will be included in the city's surplus sale in 2022. There is no allocation for replacement of these, these vehicles in 2021, nor do we anticipate delivery this year, but rather are starting procurement to minimize delay. Total budget required for these replacements is approximately 132,000 and the forecasted balance of the fleet reserves for 2022 is roughly $450,000. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Mr. Lewis. Uh, questions, comments, motions? Mr. Uh, Council Plummer? Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor. I would uh, so move that we uh, proceed with the uh, procurement of these vehicles and as uh, we give the manager operations a, you know, leeway to uh, start the process. Thank you. Is there a seconder? Councillor Reeve is seconding that motion. I also have a question. Are we going to have any difficulties with the color of the vehicles like we've had in past? Through you, Mr. Chair, we don't anticipate that. Um, with the advance opportunity to procure now, we anticipate we'll be able to get the colors that we uh, we need for our fleet. Thanks. Mr. Jackano. Thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor. As it is a changing world, and we're all uh, in the process of trying to save the planet, so to speak, has any consideration been given in the purchase of those vehicles or the requirement to have them as electric? Through you, Mr. Chair, we have been doing some research on electric vehicles. Um, electric pickup trucks are still fairly new in the world. Um, there's not too many of them around. The prices of those vehicles are extremely high at, at present. There are some hybrid uh, half-ton models that are out there as well, and we've been doing some look at those. We do not have the infrastructure to, uh, to handle electric vehicles here at the operations department, so that would be uh, some difficulty as well to try and uh, procure and install uh, charging stations and so forth. So for this particular procurement, we're not looking at electric vehicles, but it is something that we're looking at in the future. Okay, is there any other questions or comments from, uh, from council? If not, I'll call the question. Those in favor of the motion that's on the floor and that's carried, that's carried unanimously. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Mr. Lewis. Uh, next up is Community Improvement Plan, and it's Ms. Sutherland. Hi, everyone. So there's a recommendation from the Community Improvement Panel to uh, award $6,492.27 granted to Brian Rook, owner of 53 to 55 Pembroke Street West, for the Community Improvement Plan Downtown Housing Grant, subject to the Building Permit 2020-107 for an exterior staircase complete its final inspection, and that the funds be taken from the Community Improvement, Improvement Plan Reserve if necessary. So our, the Community Improvement Panel met recently to discuss this application. Uh, the applicant is looking at the Downtown Housing Grant and plans to fully renovate the kitchen and install new flooring and new paint in one unit, as well as renovate bathroom fixtures and install new flooring and new paint in a second unit. 
This applicant meets the requirements of the downtown housing grant by making the units more habitable. According to the requirements of the community improvement plan, there are to be no outstanding work orders or taxes against the property. Uh, the fire department and the treasury department had no concerns. The building department did note that there is uh, um, that building permit 2020-107 for an exterior staircase does have its final inspections outstanding. And uh, I did speak to the applicant who has noted that the work there is done and just needs to arrange that final inspection. So according to the low quote of the two quotes provided, the improvements will cost $12,984.53. Based on the guidelines of this grant, 50% of the work can be reimbursed up to a maximum of $5,000 per unit for up to two units. Therefore, this application is eligible for a grant of $6,492.27. I will note that the community improvement plan budget is for this year is $50,000. To date, $7,269 has been paid out. So if this application is approved, the total outstanding grants would be $60,172.36. So if all the applications close in 2021, the budget would be over budget by $17,000 and change. Um, the treasurer has confirmed there is $68,000 in the community improvement plan reserve. Therefore, it is possible that this application will need to be funded by funds from the reserve. Thank you. Any motions, questions, comments? I have Councillor Abdallah. Motion to accept the recommendation and approve the funds from the CIP uh, grant. Okay, and seconded by Councillor Reavy, yes. Any discussion on that motion? I have to keep looking to see if Councillor Jackano puts up his hand. Uh, okay, those in favor? <laughs> and that's carried, thank you. Uh, next up is 6D Algonquin Trail, and this is Mr. Lapier's matter. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, staff uh, requires direction regarding the use of motorized vehicles on the Algonquin Trail within the City of Pembroke, and options include to not authorize any form of motorized use, or to authorize snowmobile and ATV use, or to authorize only snowmobile use, or to authorize only ATV use. Staff also requires committee's direction uh, on reviewing the city's current snowmobile and ATV bylaws to facilitate snowmobile and ATV access to local businesses. This would be as a result of any decisions this evening. So my intention is not to uh, go over the full report. You do have a comprehensive report that's been provided to you. However, I will state the following, that this matter has been discussed for a few years now by council, and uh, there has been two presentations from County of Renfrew staff as well as their elected. City staff have presented reports on four separate occasions, and uh, council has also received information from the local snowmobile and ATV club. There's been two surveys that have been conducted and petitions have been received, the majority uh, in favor of motorized use on the trail, although there were some concerns also received. Uh, at the August 10th combined committee meeting, staff was directed to respond to various questions or concerns uh, that were to be provided by council members. So staff has taken the following actions to that end. Staff has met in person with County of Renfrew staff responsible for management of the trail. Staff has sought input from the County ATV Club as well as the snowmobile uh, representatives. And you do have uh, detailed responses uh, from the questions posed to those particular uh, groups and individuals. So the results of these interactions is in the report before committee this evening. And the Director of Operations, Mr. Lewis and I, or we'll be happy to respond to any questions that committee members may have. Thank you, Mr. Lapier. Uh, Your Worship. Um, thank you, Mr. Lapierre, for the comprehensive report because it really did answer a lot of the questions that council uh, has or committee has. Uh, therefore, I'd like to put the following motion on the floor that the Operations Committee authorizes snowmobile and ATV use on the Algonquin Trail within the City of Pembroke with re the required bylaw to come before Council at its November the 2nd, 2021 meeting for endorsement. And further, 
that city staff be directed to meet with County of Renfrew staff to address and mitigate issues and opportunities related to the Algonquin Trail as required. I have a seconder for that motion so that we can get at least this much accomplished. So, uh, well, I have Councillor Abdallah, or is it okay? So, it's, I, I do have a seconder. So, what, in keeping with our procedural bylaw, uh, if we can each, if you want to, speak to it once, and that includes myself at the end of the first go around, if there is to be reply, we can do reply once. We, as Mr. Lapier said, we've already discussed this matter four, three or four times at, at the very least. Uh, so if we follow the procedural bylaw, we should be able to move through this important issue. So having said that, uh, Your Worship, you made the motion. Did you wish to speak to it first, or have you spoken to it as you wanted to? I'd like to speak to it, but I'll be short. Um, uh, over the years, uh, when this first came up, and, and I know it's been on the table for an awful long time, I've always made the statement that I think it's important, of course, that issues be mitigated. But also what's very important from the word go is economic development of this city and the case of are there economic benefits and over the years especially the last i would say probably four years we've realized that tourism and pembroke as a destination is extremely important and in regards to uh, the tourism we put out uh, we received a marketing uh, report 2019 and part of that report indicated the importance of, uh, of tourism within the city. And I think we're seeing the results. Well, at COVID, uh, we've noticed that more and more people are involving themselves in recreation. Part of that recreation, of course, is motorized recreation. But I go back to the economic benefits. And having talked, there is not one business in this town that I'm aware of, and I've spoken to several over the years, who are not in favor of permitting the motorized um, vehicles because definitely the, the, the hotels will definitely benefit, the restaurants will definitely be, uh, benefit, also the garages. And I think one thing that's very important when we're, when we're looking at the economy of the city, at the present time, our taxpayers, the revenue we get, 69% of that comes from the taxpayers, both residential, commercial, and industrial. And the commercial, uh, is extremely important to us. If we're going to be able to lower uh, that revenue from the city, we may not be able to lower it, but I sure hope we're going to be able to. It's a case of the commercial businesses. We have to help them as much as possible. And I think this is one way of doing it. And I think we have to look long term over the next several years when, we, when we're looking at the city as a destination. We have everything here for us. We have the beautiful waterfront. We have the murals. We, we have everything where we could gather people here. And at the same time, what helps us here is we are now involving the four seasons. And I think that's what's important. And I'm not granted, I've only spoken to a few people who have moved to the city uh, since the summer. And we know very well that some of them were quite uh, annoyed the fact they couldn't park their boats because as it is now they're moving from the city what a beautiful area but we have uh, a tremendous number of people wishing to use uh, the, the slips down at the marina so the summer and spring were well covered uh, but fall winter uh, I, I think this will encourage people to come to the city and I know there are various events that, that could be held so uh, I the economic benefits, uh, as far as I'm concerned, outweigh uh, some of the issues that we have because we could correct and work on, on the issues. But I think it, th this is important for the city. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. So, His Worship Swope, Councillor Lafreniere. Thank you. Um, I have read all the paper that we were provided with. Uh, some of it gave me some information that I thought was valuable, but very little of it uh, actually applied to us here in Pembroke. So not too long ago, this council debated on whether to allow city residents to have a fire pit in their backyard. This fire pit would have been controlled by criteria like size of lot, access to water, inspections, etc. The council decided against it and cited health hazards of smoke and smell as some of the reasons. 
Now we are contemplating approving ATV use along the yards of our residents and through our waterfront area where we welcome thousands of visitors and residents in the spring, summer and fall. ATVs can cause dust, they can throw up stones, and some older models are, are extremely loud. Just recently, some ATVs actually ran over some family pets in the Arm Prior area, so they can be dangerous if they're not being used cautiously. Um, I guess one ran into a Tim Hortons in Petawawa. So what I'm looking at here, we've been presented by a stack of statistics on how much ATV owners spend on their vehicles, et cetera, and how much revenue is generated by the manufacturing sector in Ontario and retail, that type of thing. I wondered if anyone had gotten statistics from like the police departments or the health departments. So I did my own research today and I came up with some interesting statistics, which I welcome you all to look for uh, it's on Public Health Ontario. It's the epidemiology of all-terrain vehicle and snowmobile-related injuries in Ontario. And I won't bother you with the numbers, but it's staggering the difference between snowmobile injuries and ATV injuries. Um, the numbers are about triple for ATV. And the types of... I'll just read you this one uh, paragraph. Emergency, here it is here. A higher proportion of injured rioters who were hospitalized were reported as drivers for ATVs. Uh, emergency room visits and hospitalizations were stratified by the location that the injury took place. More emergency room visits and hospitalizations were related to injuries sustained in non-highway environments, so that's private property and recreational trails compared to injuries sustained on the highway. So that disturbs me. Um, the number for snowmobiles was 2,800, and for ATVs, it was over 11,000. So that, that alarms me. Um, so I'm just, I'm, co I'm comparing a fire pit in someone's backyard, which was set, that's bad for neighbors, and I'm looking at motorized vehicles traveling through neighborhood communities and our waterfront. So I kind of see a mismatch there when it comes to priorities for health in our community and safety. Now I've had many conversations with the residents of the city who pay taxes to the city. And I've also, we've all seen the emails from some that live along the trail. And their voices are, are falling a little more quiet than the ATV clubs, the snowmobile clubs, and all the people who obviously are advocating on their behalf. The majority of the people I speak to, so obviously I travel in different circles than some people, they're preferring active transportation, walking, cycling, e-cycling. I mean, I've even talked to ATV owners, one that lives on my street, who said he didn't buy an ATV to travel through downtown Pembroke. He bought it to go out in the rural community. He said that this trail is actually quite boring, and he often takes it from from uh, you know, uh, Trafalgar Road to Petawawa. He says it's boring, so he can't understand why ATVs would even be interested. Now, if you read one of the reports that we were given on how much they spend, if you break it down, it reported that 170, approximately $178 was spent per atv -er, but that's the entire county. So I don't know. I think we're selling ourselves a little short. I don't see a lot of revenue coming out of the ATVs when it comes to staying overnight. Because if you look, most of their trips are three-hour trips, half-day trips. Very few are multi-day trips. The snowmobiles, however, no one can deny the business that they bring into the city. Now, I read the staff report. And one of the options I love for ATVs, I'm not saying ATVs don't come here. I'm just saying not downtown. I support item three in the Algonquin Trail question, the answers to our questions that we asked about optional trails. We can still bring ATVs in from Petawawa through the west. They would still come along that trail they always come on that old uh, 
trail that's there right now. They could come in behind Germania, cross Bennett, go through Pemice too. It's already been discussed with our recreation department. And they could still access Irving, Best Western. I just can't see them in the downtown. So that's my opinion. Um, winter is the best for when it comes to vehicular because people's windows are closed, the noise factor's less, there's less to do in the winter, so obviously we want to promote people getting outdoors. But I think that in the summer they have so much more to do, and I for one don't know too many people on an ATV that are going to jump off in downtown and in their, go buy a dress or, you know, I don't see a lot of retail. They may stop at a restaurant, yes, but I don't think it's worth the disruption to the lifestyle of the residents along the trail or to the people that already use our beautiful waterfront. So that's, that's a long-winded way of saying I am in favor of snowmobiles using any trail system they want in the winter, but I would rather look at that alternate trail for ATVs because of the dust, the noise, and that I'm not going to belabor it. That's my opinion. I respect everyone else around here. I just don't want to see that. Oh, one more thing I didn't like was the fact that the county would look at a cost-sharing option to pave that portion of the trail in our downtown when they own the land. So that kind of disturbed me that, you know, they, they would do it, but only if we paid a cost-sharing. Anyway, I'm done with that. Thank you for your time. Anyone else wish to speak? Councilor Plummer. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, so I'm, uh, we all know that most of this CP uh, rail line was a, well, it was a rail line at one time. We had trains that went by, so there was noise at one time. And, you know, I think a lot of people have forgotten that there used to be actual trains that went by at one time. So we understand the residents uh, live along that, uh, live along the trail, the, rail, the old rail line. So there was impact at one time um, in noise. Uh, so I'm not really so concerned about that, uh, you know, as going slow on an ATV, they, they do produce some noise, but um, not, I don't think, as much as a train going by or blowing a torn. But my moral concern is the dust. Um, so I would certainly, I have no issue with snowmobiles. Uh, as wintertime, it's snow, uh, people have the windows closed, you're not hanging laundry outside, things like that. My major concern is dust within the city of Pembroke with ATVs. Um, Kicking it up. I've been on trails, uh, dust, stone dusted. The dust is in the, in the word of that they're putting on, or the old uh, rail slag. Um, it just gets everywhere. So I wouldn't want to be a homeowner next to a trail with with um, motorized via, uh, ATVs running by and having to not be able to have my clothes outside or have to wash my siding or other things like that, wash my vehicles because it's just getting covered in dust every time a, a, a group goes by. I would certainly be in favor of approving it if they paved the trail within the city boundaries, then I think it eliminates that, that concern. And I would certainly give my full support to both ATVs and snow. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I'm just looking who, who's left. Does anyone else wish to speak that Councillor Jackson and then Councillor Reavy? Uh, Deputy Mayor, I guess, uh, you know, the mayor had kind of hit on the point that uh, it's a different world today. Uh, people are looking to, you know, spend their money and tourist activities that may require motorized vehicles. And I know that Councillor Pernier, uh, you know, had a bit of an issue with the, the fact that we wouldn't allow people to have open air burning pits in the community, but open air burning pits do not create revenue or tax revenue in the community. Whereas people staying in a motel, uh, buying gasoline, eating food, as the report indicates. I've read the report thoroughly from one end to the other. And I think it's just the tip of the iceberg. But as I said previously, you have to offer people something to come here to do. You can't just say, well, you're going to drive through, see you later. Uh, thanks for creating some dust in our community. And thanks for creating a snow cloud, but now you're not here anymore. You have to create an event that will draw those people here. We have the infrastructure. Uh, we have the, you know, we, we have the trail as such. Uh, and I have, I have a quandary, I guess, with the ATVs, raising dust, et cetera. But I mean, how do you, how do you, you know, how do you divide uh, one from the other? 
Uh, both people are sports enthusiasts. Both people spend gasoline. People travel on ATVs and they go to areas and stay in motels. I've seen them. Uh, you know, there are trails that they use. So if we want to attract people, I, I, I guess, do we say, yes, we'll accept you, but no, we won't accept you because you're creating some dust. Uh, I think there are solutions to every problem. If you're not having them on the trail, the option was to have them along uh, a roadway. And I mean, if you're traveling on a pavement, you're not raising dust. I would probably, I not probably, I would be in favor of accepting both to provide economic development for our community for the future. Councilor Reavy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I've been in support um, of, of multi-use on the trail since it first came to this table. And, um, and I'm not, you know, I've never tried to hide that. Um, I appreciate Councilor Lafreniere's um, bringing us information um, from Public Health Ontario. I did pull up the report here. And yes, they are dangerous. ATVs and snowmobiles are dangerous, can be dangerous in the hands or driven by the wrong person. So are all of our motor vehicles, um, bicycles on the roadways. That's just a fact of life in the human condition. So we hope that people would drive responsibly, look after themselves and their passengers. So I'm not overly concerned about the danger of passing through city limits at 20 kilometers an hour um, and abiding by the rules of the trail. Uh, I don't mind the idea of paving um, to cut down on dust. I do get that. and. Uh, so I, I would be in favor of looking at that option um, while supporting both uh, ATV and snowmobile use. Um, so I think, you know, we have danced around this issue for a very long time. I think we really do need to make a decision. And I think that we will see um, a lot of tourism benefits in the, um, in the, the not too distant future. I did appreciate too, Mr. Lapierre, um, the report including the options for um, the Bennett Street connection so that we're not leaving the South End businesses out of the loop because they have, uh, they've seen a lot of um, particular snowmobile traffic in, in the past year. So uh, I really hope to see um, everybody use the trail um, and get along using the trail. I know it's possible, and uh, that's really all I have to say at this point. Thank you, Councillor Reeve. Councillor Abdallah. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. <clears throat> uh, July 16th, 2019, Councillor Frenia made a motion, and I seconded it to talk to C CN about the possibility of buying the section for $25,000 and Councillor Plummer supported it and it got defeated. We know there was environmental issues and in hindsight, Laurentian Valley didn't want to buy their section so, you know, it was a mute point. So on December 1st, I expressed the following concern at the council meeting. I said, if a piece of land is sold on the CN trail, then the lease is null and void and snowmobile and ATV users will have no way to get through Pembroke. So here we are tonight. So there's no way to, for them to get through Pembroke. So I'm a realist, as we all are. The multi-use Algonquin Trail is only going to succeed if we follow the three R's. Respect, responsibility, and relationships. The whole dynamic of the waterfront the tranquility of it will change. It's therefore imperative that everyone works together to make it, make it a success, successful multi-use trail. And I wear glasses and they're not rose-colored glasses. I'm not gonna paint a rosy picture. There will be issues. We've talked about the issues. We know about the issues. There's issues down between Greenside Street and the Supples Landing. Um, I was at a, we were at a community watch meeting a few weeks ago and there was a gentleman on an ATV and the young person had no helmet on behind the ice cream stand. So this is what we don't want. We don't want issues like that. 
users who disrespect the bylaws, speed enforcement will need to listen and learn so that the trail can be safe and enjoyed by everyone. As far as the detour goes, that's the last resort. The, uh, it's not sensible right now. It's a short distance from Albert to Alexander Street, so we, we try that way. I am in favor of paving, if that, if that can be done. I encourage the county to look into that. Um, we have a triangle here. We have, we have user groups, the community at the top, the residents of the trail. We have ATV club, a snowmobile club. We have cyclists, we have walkers, we have snowshoers. So they're at the top of the triangle. We have the city in this corner, the city of Pembroke City Council. And over here we have the county of Renfrew. So we have respect, responsibility, and relationships. And everyone's going to have to work together to make this work. I've spoken to, as we all have, the, the president of the ATV club, the president of the snowmobile club. Mr. Lapierre and I have met numerous times. He's assured me that it's going to work. It has to work. If worse came to worse, we would make a decision to temporarily shut down the trail till problems were dealt with. So any issues that happen will have to be done with as soon as possible, not next week. So I'm concerned, as we all are, about the residents along the trail, the people who visit the waterfront, how is this going to affect them? The safety, noise, the pollution, that's going to have to be dealt with. Active living, recreation, we're, we're about to embark on an $80,000 active living master plan. How is the trail going to fit into that with active living? Economic development, I've met with the PBA yesterday. They're, they're interested in, in attracting the ATVs, maybe possibly parking at the end of Victoria Street or at the farmer's market when it's not in use. Snowmobiles could park there in the wintertime. It's a visible site. You get less, less chance of theft. It will give them access to the east end of downtown. And I understand from your report, Mr. Lapier, that the old wall, across the old Wally Shoes location, if some of us remember Wally Shoes, at the entrance to Algonquin, they'll be parking there also. So tourism, economic development, economic environmental impact. The fact is they have no way through. So we have to work together to make this happen. I, I've publicly spoken that I prefer the other route but that's, 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 not a, that's not a feasible, it's, it's not gonna happen, it's closed now. So we need to make this a positive benefit for everyone and uh, a healthy benefit and it has to work. And the County of Renfrew has assured us that they will work with us to make it work. The, the bad apples, as Mayor Bob Sweet said when he spoke just a few weeks ago, they, they ruin it for people. So that is gonna have to be dealt with and I don't want to get into details because staff is going to come back with a report for the ATV bylaw and the snowmobile bylaw. We don't want them on Frank uh, Fred Blackstein Boulevard or the Green Space, the Kiwanis Walkway, but that will all be dealt with. And it's, a, it's an education, it's a, it's a learning process, um, but I, I do support the motorized traffic because the CN is not available. And I'm, I'm as concerned as you are, Councillor Frenier, about the residents. And uh, I spoke to a resident today and I told the resident I will work, I will do my part to make sure that this works and represent them. And we all have to do our part. And so I, I will be supporting the uh, motion put forward by Mayor LeMay. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Abdallah. So then from the chair, because by my count, everyone has now spoken once. I, I want to thank uh, Mr. Lapier, and Mr. Lewis, and all of staff for putting forward uh, another detailed report on this issue concerning the Algonquin Trail, uh, which includes, as you know, many different attachments, uh, very much addressing uh, the different inquiries that uh, were to be posed uh, following the Last time, I think it was combined committee in August, uh, um, was uh, to present to Mr. Uh, Mr. Lapier to comment on. Uh, certainly, as with everyone else, uh, you know, I've had an opportunity to review all the different materials, looked at the notes from the 
three or four times that this came before council. Uh, it's trite to say, but we, we've had presentations from uh, not only the two different clubs, we've had presentations from a, an, a, a group of individuals indicating that they were not in favor of the uh, of the Algonquin Trail. This has been sent to the Police Services Board for comment. This has been sent to different staff members, including Mr. Lewis, who is on the line uh, this, this evening to comment on any operational issues that uh, um, you know might be posed. And certainly we need to move forward and we, we need to uh, make a decision as was indicated before the combined committee. Um, so um, I've tried to keep this meeting moving uh, forward and so I'm trying to be as brief as I can. Certainly I, I've tried on previous occasions to um, to indicate why it is that I was in favor of uh, moving forward with the motorized use in addition to uh, the, the uh, passive use and that being both ATV and snowmobile use. I've said in the past and I say it again that I have every faith in staff, Mr. Lapier, Mr. Lewis and all the way down uh, the, to ensure that the uh, operational, I'll call it for lack of a better word, uh, the operational nuts and bolts of things will be addressed, whether that be uh, speeding issues, so putting on a hat in terms of the police board and the save team, uh, looking at uh, bylaw enforcement to uh, to enforce speeding and uh, and that sort of thing, uh, to signage. We've heard about the insurance that these different clubs carry. I know that Mr. Uh, Lapier has in his report at some point in this report uh, commenting about having uh, the City of Pembroke as a name insured so I have every faith that the city of Pembroke um, should this uh, motion pass that the city of Pembroke's staff will address each and every different items and it, it may be uh, you know on the issue of dust it may be that certain mitigation efforts will not uh, suffice, uh, whether that be foliage. And so certainly Councillor Abdallah and myself uh, uh, sit on that waterfront development uh, uh, committee with uh, Fred Blackstein as the lead. And certainly he's more than abundantly aware in terms of having appropriate foliage, as I understand it, to not only deflect sound, but to deflect dust. But if that doesn't cut it, I have no doubt that uh, in talking to Mr. Lewis about uh, issues like uh, using calcium chloride and other materials to keep dust down and if that doesn't do it then looking at other measures whether it's tar and chip or paving or what have you but I, I think as, as a council we deal with the policy issue as to whether or not to uh, enable this uh, use to happen and then at that point we hand it over into the hands of staff uh, who is hearing this evening both Mr. Lewis and Mr. Lapier what the concerns of this council uh, are uh, and that they carry forward on those particular concerns to ensure that uh, uh, that they are are addressed as, as it moves forward but um, it's trite to say listening to some of the different individuals tonight but I'll repeat it is, is to look at it from a, an economic standpoint to, to try and uh, generate uh, tourism to generate uh, uh, and to uh, attempt to alleviate uh, some of the tax burden off the residential base which has always as long as I've known carried the majority of the uh, uh, the tax burden in the city of Pembroke which just simply isn't right um, so that's my my particular uh, uh, comments on the subject. And so now in terms of reply, one more time for anyone that wishes to speak, uh, and then we'll call the question and I would be asking for Mr. Lapier on such a serious matter to uh, have a recorded vote. So having said all of that, who wants to, Councillor Lafrenia, you're gonna kick off the reply? I certainly will. It will be a little more brief than my opening one. However, I mean, I the economic benefits are to be debated and they're to be proven later, um, not when it comes to snowmobiles, but the ATVs I'm still not sold on they spending that kind of money on staying overnight when it's summertime. However, um, the only way I would even consider ATVs was if I thought that that portion, as it's in the report from staff, was paved from College Way to the, this side of the beer store. Um, but as you can see in the report, the county would be willing to receive a request on cost sharing for paving a portion of the trail in Pembroke, although it may be doubtful that would actually be approved by county council. So if we were going to pave it, it would probably be at the dime of the city taxpayers, which bothers me, because this is something the county has been trying to push through, whether we agree with it or not. We were kind of pushed up against the fence on this again, even though it's been in front of us for a while. They, you know, they're at our border now knocking on our door. 
So they want it, they want it bad. So I would suggest that part of this motion is that we approve it you know, in principle, and I would be willing to support it in principle, based on the county paving that portion from College Way to the beer, just west of the beer store. At, you know, that takes the waterfront aspect out of the rocks flying or whatever, dust. It also takes away a little bit of that other area, but I won't be supporting the motion unless we can get something in it that clearly states that the county would be responsible for paving. Because let's face it, we're still going to have to pay for the maintenance, for the policing, for work uh, around the intersections of it, of the actual trail. Um, anyway, that, that's, that's all I want to say, is I, I, I won't support it unless we have some kind of condition that the county pays for the pavement. pavement. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Plummer, Councillor Reavy. Yeah, I'm still not uh, <clears throat> convinced that both, uh, that ATVs is a great idea. Even snowmobiles is a great idea, Throwing, going through a downtown with uh, liability issues and whatnot. I just don't think that um, there may be some leeway with uh, snowmobiles during the winter just because it is the, the season. And they do tend to cross highways and they maybe have some experience doing that. Uh, but no, I'm just, uh, I just don't see the economic benefit. I see, unfortunately, I'm with uh, Councillor Lefreni on this. I'd see it more as a drive-through, uh, basically continuing. Pembroke's just going to be a pass-through on their way on the trail. Uh, I do understand the focus of the trail uh, to connect everything and we're kind of the one last piece in the long puzzle. But it's a really unfortunate that um, oh, hindsight's 2020 back in the day when we first were elected this council here. When the CN came knocking and they were looking to dispose a bunch of land, might have been the proper thing to pick all that up at that time, but you never know. Anyways, I won't be supporting it. Thank you. Councillor Reavy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just um, a reminder that the, uh, the town of Almont was vehemently opposed to having multi-use going through the Algonquin Trail. They call it different there. Um, and flash forward a few years and they love it they have seen huge economic benefit yes in the summer with the ATV people and they would not go back to to um, the way they were thinking beforehand um, the other thing is and this is just so recent and and I had to give it a little bit of a ha ha but when we were at the town hall meeting at the waterfront on October 6th a beautiful evening um, committee was seated beside the, uh, by the, beside the amphitheater and as the presentation was taking place on stage with not a really great microphone system, um, Jody could be heard, but, but quietly, I watched as an ATV side by side putted down the trail and nobody turned to look. Even um, the person sitting beside me who has been very opposed to multi-use uh, on the trail didn't even notice. So I just sort of thought, I'm going to just tuck that in my pocket for later use. So it told me that the distance of that Algonquin Trail from the amphitheater where there will be, you know, amplified performances, this was just a speaker on a microphone, it would not disturb what's going on. So... That was something that made me happy, and it was proof to me. Oh, <laughs> Councillor Jackano. Geez, I should have been there. You keep missing me. Uh, Deputy Mayor, I kind of have, uh, I agree with Councillor Plummer in a way that people will just pass through. But you know what? If they just pass through, that's not their fault. That's our fault. We haven't done anything to capture their attention to come here. And I said that previously. I had met with a downtown business person some time ago who was complaining that there was no traffic in the downtown. So I went to meet with the individual and I said, you're going to have a group of people, 600 runners, running down the main street of Pembroke, right past your door. What have you done to entice them to come into your store. Well, they're not gonna come in there was the answer because they were in the run. But after the run, 
they're there with their families. They're looking to buy an ice cream. They're looking to have lunch. So if, you know, if that type of attitude exists, of course, nothing is going to happen. If you don't look at what's in front of you, you're not going to benefit. So you have a couple of major runs that take place in this community. I think it's the Tim Armstrong run, and the other one is, um, forgive me, I can't remember the name, but there are thousands of participants right here. So if you can attract those people to come here for a purpose, it's our job as the City of Pembroke employees to come up with a plan in this council to say, okay, we've approved this. Now, what are we going to do to make it better, to make sure it's safe, uh, you know, to make sure that nobody's hurt and provide some people with some good entertainment and to get them to stop here and spend some money in our businesses so that our taxpayers and our taxpaying businesses can thrive. I will be voting in favor of both uses. Okay, thank you. So I have left for reply. Uh, second go around is Councillor Abdallah and His Worship. Do either of you wish to speak? No, thank you. So His Worship doesn't wish to speak. Councillor Abdallah. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. So like I said before, uh, the CN section is sold and this is the only way through Pembroke. Now, uh, the Waterfront Development Committee that the Deputy Mayor referred to that we sit on, we're developing a plan. Mr. Blackstein came here a few weeks ago for an arboretum and it's gonna have room for three large exhibition tents for destination events. It's gonna open up people's imagination. There's gonna be destination events there for ATV years to come, tours. That's just one spot. Riverside Park, we had a drive-in concert that was very successful, 320 cars put on by the Rec Rec Parks and Rec Department. We met last night, the, par the Parks and Rec Advisory Committee. We have some ideas for another festival uh, next summer at the same location, hopefully with a midway, some children's events. So that's a destination event. We know that the ATV clubs can access Riverside Park. They have festivals, they have one day events, they have camp outs. So these are things that will happen. I already mentioned the potential of the farmer's market parking there for snowmobiles also, and over they're gonna be parking near the college. So it's the only way through town. So realistically, where are they gonna go? So east, west, I've read all the reports. We do know that they can still access the uh, hotels, the Best Western, the Holiday Inn, and the Big Stop. Parks and Recreation are work, working with them on an alternate route through Germania Club behind the Femites too. That's important, that was another concern. But it's um, imperative that we approve this and move forward. And the destination events are being planned, they'll be there. The waterfront's a destination place, Riverside Park. So that's why I'm going to support it just had a question for Mr. Lapier, though, that I meant to ask earlier. We'd been discussing this. Um, calls for service. Can you explain the procedure if you work with Mr. Davis at the county and Mr. Kelly? If calls for service got out of hand, how would you act on that? Certainly. I'm, I'm, I've been clearly advised by Mr. Davis and, uh, and uh, Craig, his director, that if there's any individuals that have problems related to the trail or what's happening on the trail, they can call them directly and they will deal with it. And they also know that those individuals may call a member of council or myself and we'll make sure that the county is dealing with it. But they have in the past, and I have reported, that there have been minor issues related to the, to the trail and they have dealt with those, those issues. So if calls or if concerns became a major issue. Of course, that's why part of the uh, staff report states that staff of the county and the city would be meeting at least twice a year or more often as required to deal with issues that require attention, but also to deal with opportunities that uh, may arise that could be a benefit to us. So that's how those things uh, would be dealt with. I understand Councillor Frenya has a question, and after that, I would ask Mr. Lapier to do his, uh, his call in terms of the recorded vote. So my question is to Mr. Lapier. 
but I want him to clarify something in the report for Councillor Abdalla and anyone else who thought there was not another alternate trail. There is an alternate option, am I correct, Mr. Lapier? And that is to use the existing route that comes in now from the west along that trail, but then when it comes over the Trust Boundary Road, it goes over to behind the Germania Club. Then it crosses Bennett, goes behind PMC, and goes out the same way that they're doing now. So there is an alternate route. And can you clarify that for me, Mr. Lapierre? Yes, certainly. As the report states, yeah. there has been discussions with the Snowmobile Club mm -hmm. and the ATV Club would fall into this, that there is a proposed route that, uh, that is amenable to city staff as well as a Snowmobile Club. Mm -hmm. That would provide uh, access to the, to the businesses that uh, are in the south of Pembroke. Mm -hmm. Primarily, we're talking about the uh, Big Stop, Best Western, Holiday Inn. However, as I recall in the report, it states that without the Algonquin Trail, there would be zero access to the East End businesses in Pembroke. So that would be a concern. So yes, there is in that particular route. That addresses the CN mm -hmm. line to get, uh, to get to those properties in the South End, but the Algonquin Trail is still required uh, with respect to the East End. Exactly, but it would be status quo then. If we adopted that alternate, it would be the businesses that have been benefiting would continue to. That's correct. Okay, thank you. So that, oh, excuse me, I should point out, I don't know that it would be 100% correct because uh, as I recall from the, from the reports and the discussions that, that the trail coming to Pembroke would stop in the east end at Whitewater Road and it would stop in the west end closer to Petawawa. So it would deal with the west end part, but there'd be nothing to support the east end access to, for snowmobiles to come to the east end of Pembroke, which is currently able to be done as well, but that would be stopped. But you are correct that in the west end, we'll call it the south end, that if council supported uh, you know, what staff is suggesting the snowmobile club, that would certainly assist in uh, dealing with the issue now with the CN line disrupted. Thank you, and uh, so I've been very clear at the beginning as chair as to the process, attempting to follow the procedural bylaw, which we often don't always do. So at this point, Mr. Lapier, if you would uh, uh, do the uh, recorded vote, and then that will address this particular matter. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I will defer to the clerk in the room to take the recorded vote. Ms. Martin. <laughs> Councillor Abdalla. Yay. Councillor Giacono? Yes. Councillor Lafreniere? Nay. Councillor Plummer? Nay. Councillor Reavy? Yes. Mayor LeMay? Yay. Deputy Mayor Gerva? Yay. So we have five people in favour and two against, so the motion carries. Thank you, and no disrespect, Ms. Uh, Heidi. <laughs> Trying to get used to the different <laughs> positions. Um, having said that, as I understand it, Mr. Lapier, and I've already switched uh, uh, items on my iPad, do I understand correctly that you were looking for some direction once we got past that particular item? Yes, if it's acceptable to committee, staff will prepare the required uh, amendments to the ATV and snowmobile bylaws for consideration at your November second meeting. Thank you, and I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. Councillor Reavy, Councillor Plummer, we are adjourned.
I'd like to call this council meeting of Tuesday, October the 19th, 2021 to order. Before opening this meeting of council, I'd ask those who wish, each in your own way, silently join in a prayer of guidance over these proceedings. Thank you. Is there any disclosure of pecuniary interest and general nature thereof? Seeing none. Approving our minutes from our regular council meeting held on October the 5th, 2021. Moved by Councillor Reavy, seconded by Councillor Plummer. All those in favour? Carried. Adopting the minutes from our operations committee meeting held on September the 21st, 2021. Moved by. Councillor Plummer, seconded by. Councillor Jackano. All those in favour? Carried. Receiving the minutes from the Pembroke Heritage Murals Committee of October the 6th, 2021. Moved by Councillor Abdallah, seconded by Councillor Reavy. All those in favor? Carried. Proclamation. By virtue of the power vested in me, I here do by declare Thursday, October the 21st, 2021, as the 20th Annual Child Care Worker and Early Childhood Educator Appreciation Day in the City of Pembroke. Whereas years of research confirm the benefits of high quality child care for young children's intellectual, emotional, social, and physical development and later life outcomes, and whereas child care promotes the well being of children and responds to the needs of parents, families and the broader community by supporting quality of life so that citizens can fully participate in and contribute to the economic and social life of their community. And whereas trained and knowledgeable early childhood educators and child care staff are the key to quality in early learning and child care programs and champions for children, I, Michael LeMay, Mayor of the City of Pembroke, do hereby proclaim Thursday, October the 21st, 2021, Child Care Worker and Early Childhood Educator, Educator Appreciation Day in the City of Pembroke. Bylaws, Councillor Plummer. Thank you, Worship. Moved by myself, Cycle by Councillor Jackano, that bylaw 2021 56, a bylaw to authorize the use of internet voting, paper ballots, and voting tabulators for the 2022 municipal election be adopted and passed. And further, this head bylaw be signed by the mayor and clerk and seal the seal of the corporation. Are there any comments? Okay. Seeing none, all those in favor? Okay. Carried. Uh, resolution 2021-028, Councilor Lafreniere. Moved by myself, seconded by Councilor Andrew Plummer. Whereas routine eye care is critical in early detection of eye diseases and the health of eyes is critical to overall health and quality of life, and whereas payments from OHIP have only increased 9% over the last 30 years, which has not come close to matching inflation of costs, and whereas the lack of funding makes it difficult to invest in modern technology and new technology means earlier detection of eye disease, and whereas the provincial government's refusal to f formally negotiate with optometrists for more than 30 years has forced the optometrist to absorb approximately $173 million annually in the cost to deliver eye care to Ontarians. And whereas the 2021 Ontario budget did not address OHIP insured eye care, Ontario optometrists took action and voted to withdraw OHIP services starting September 1st, 2021 unless the government agrees to legally binding negotiations to fund these services at least to the cost of delivery. And whereas this job action will jeopardize good eye care for those who need the care of an optometrist the most and will have the greatest impact on the most vulnerable groups. Therefore, be it resolved that the Council of the City of Pembroke requests that the provincial government recognize the value that access to quality eye care brings to all Ontarians and act now to protect it. And further that the provincial government address the OHIP insured eye care immediately and enter into legally binding negotiations with Ontario optometrists to fund these services at least to the cost of delivery. 
and further that a copy of this resolution be forwarded to Premier Ford, Ontario Minister of Health Christine Elliott, MPP John Yakubuski, the Ontario Association of Optometrists, and to the Association of Municipalities of Ontario, AMO. Any comments? I do have a comment. Mm -hmm. I have a granddaughter who's probably going to need glasses, and she cannot get into an optometrist. And that's a sad state of affairs when our government will not protect them. And we all know that there's lots of serious illnesses that can be detected through a proper eye exam. So I think in this day and age, when health, and especially with COVID, health is so important in lifestyle and well-being, uh, mental health as well, I can't believe they are dropping the ball. And 30 years later, these professionals in our community, well-respected optometrists, are begging. And I just can't believe it. So I am fully in support when I saw this resolution coming forward. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lafreniere. And, and as Councillor Lafreniere said, that this affects children under the age of 19 mm -hmm. and seniors over the age of 65. And we have a lot of people in our community who just can't go and find some money to, and they worry about their grandchildren or their children. So I think it's an issue where, where the government has to, has to sit down with the autonomous and, and resolve this, because a lot of children are going to suffer in the meantime. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All those in favor, carry unanimously. Thank you. Resolution 2021-029, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Your Worship. Move on myself, second by Councillor Reavy. Be it resolved that the Corporation of the City of Pembroke approves the application from Mr. Brian Rook at 53 through 55 Pembroke Street West under the Community Improvement Plan that the applicant must comply with the grant guidelines of the Downtown Housing Grant and will have 18 months to complete all work and submit receipts in order to receive said grant. The grant total awarded to this particular applicant is $6,492.27. Thank you. All those in favor? Okay, carried. Mayor's report. On Saturday afternoon, I attended Branch 72's annual Veterans Dinner. I brought greetings on behalf of the city, and I thank them on Council's behalf for their continued service to our community. Wanda Laverne, the branch manager, provided us with an excellent presentation on the history of the poppy. And I'd like to remind people that the poppy drive will begin this year on October the 31st, and that all the funds that are received through the Poppy Drive stay in the community and, of course, help the veterans and their families. Some good news on the COVID-19 front. Over 88% of Renfrew County's 12 and older population have received one dose, and over 83% have received two doses. I again urge anyone who's eligible and hasn't yet gotten vaccinated, please do so. And I remind everyone that no matter what you think of the proof of vaccination policies, to always be kind to the staff you encounter at the businesses having to enforce them. Businesses are doing what they have to in order to stay open and survive. As always, I celebrate your support for our local business community and hope that our support comes with kindness and compassion. Are there any notices of motion? Seeing none, Councillor updates. Councillor Abdallah. Thank you, Your Worship. We have a few updates tonight. The uh, PBA would like to remind residents that the veteran, veterans' banners are up downtown. These have been uh, sponsored by families of the uh, veterans who fought for our freedom in the wars. And they honor local veterans, and they were put up uh, recently a few days ago. So they are located various on the streetlights and posts downtown. Um, the Pembroke Care for Community Garden will be holding a membership meeting this Saturday at 1 o'clock, uh, October 23rd. And we invite anyone who wants more information or to join the community garden for the next growing season to come to the corner of River Road and Deacon Street <laughs> at 1 o'clock to our community garden year-end meeting. We've had a very successful year. We were able to uh, help the St. Joseph Food Bank many times with the uh, large produce that we donated to them. And I thank all the volunteers responsible for that. I'll, I'll be having a full report at the next meeting on the community garden. Um, on behalf of the Pembroke Waterfront Development Committee, on Friday, November 5th at 3 p.m., 
there is a Pembroke Waterfront Park proposed enhancements site visit. Uh, City Council is endorsing the joint centennial project by Pembroke's Horticultural Society and the Kiwanis Club. And this project, as we know, will see the uh, remaining green space enhanced with an arboretum and a variety of family friendly features such as book trees, bird habitat, destination event space, pop-up dining, and a solar-powered fountain. Members of the public are invited to attend and offer input following a brief presentation and tour by Fred Blackstein and the committee. So this will be the town hall, and that is going to be on the city website and social media later in the week. That's on November 5th, Friday at 3 p.m. So anybody who wants to provide input can go to the waterfront on that day. Um, October 30th, the city is sponsoring, in conjunction with the Colony Skateboard Shop, a trick or, trick or no treat event at the Rapid Skateboard Park at 12 o'clock. Uh, best trick costume is mandatory to do, to do a trick on the skateboard. <laughs> Prizes and candy, and there will be live music at this event. There will be live local bands playing. So that, if you want more information, you can call the Recreation Department for more information. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, two items. Uh, the first up is, ju is just to give uh, Council an update in terms of the community watch. Our last meeting was September 25th, and although it was a smaller group that uh, attended, it was a different group of individuals than what we had seen uh, previously with lots of, uh, lots of particular questions. The OPP, again, endorsing uh, the, uh, the program, had uh, Constable Peaver attend. Um, so it was a very interesting meeting. Certainly, uh, we're you know leaps and bounds ahead. We now have uh, badges made for individuals to be able to go door to door literature, and so they're going to be doing that between now and the next meeting, which is at the Pembroke Fire Hall on November fifteenth at seven. And certainly, if anyone wishes to uh, attend, uh, if they could contact either Councillor Abdallah or myself in advance. But certainly, that program is moving ahead, and so there will be uh, individuals approaching uh, individuals in their own neighborhoods uh, to uh, educate them on what the neighborhood watch is and what it isn't and to uh, uh, get individuals interested and get that program up and running. Um, the next item that I just wanted to bring council uh, attention to was the spooky movie night that was held at the Skylight uh, drive-in on October 16th. I just wanted to let council know that uh, um, it was very well attended. Uh, great cooperation between our city and the township of Laurentian Valley. A shout out to Laurentian Valley's Nevada Sergeant and our Sarah Friedmark for, uh, sorry, Frederick, Sarah, Sarah Frederick for doing an excellent uh, job on, on uh, uh, certainly advertising that particular event and the turnout that, that happened at that event. Lots of individuals that seem to like Halloween almost more than Christmas, uh, certainly uh, really dressing up and so it became very hard to uh, do the judging and to, uh, to pick the, uh, the winners for the different categories, but we, uh, we did our thing, and uh, uh, but everyone there that uh, that did take part certainly are uh, are a winner in terms of uh, uh, their interest in that particular event and dressing up, whether it be a Cindy Lou Who or you name it, uh, they were dressed. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Deputy Mayor. Any other comments, Councillor Reeby? Thank you, Your Worship. Just a short one. Last Thursday, I was um, happy to represent Mayor and Council at a small ribbon cutting ceremony at the new Renfrew County District Health Unit on Lake Street. Um, it was actually a welcome to downtown uh, from the PBIA. So everybody was very happy and I can say that um, the staff at our CDH, you are thrilled to be in downtown Pembroke and to have all the opportunities that they didn't have up um, at the county building previously. So we'll, we'll see some action in downtown, I'm sure, with all these women uh, going for lunch and dress shopping. <laughs> Councillor Lafreniere, so it was nice. Excellent. Any other comments? Seeing none, we'll be moving closed session. Councillor Abdallah. Thank you, Your Worship. Motion for Council to move into a caucus meeting. Motion by myself, seconded by Councillor Christine Reevey that this meeting become a closed meeting to discuss a position, plan, procedure, criteria, or instruction to be applied to any negotiations carried on or to be carried on by or on behalf of the municipality and a proposed or pending acquisition 
or disposition of land by the municipality or local board. Thank you. All those in favor? Okay, we'll now move into a closed session. Thank you.